it's me who is saying thank you to you for, for giving me this opportunity to, to give a, you can say, an industrial perspective on the research. Um, here at Arla, I'm responsible for, for, you could say, overall responsible for our university research collaborations. And uh, we have around 80 uh, projects running at any time, uh, collaboration projects with the universities. So science is really, you could say, the basis for our work and for our products. Uh, I would like to hear, give you a few, few examples of, uh, of how detailed scientific input uh, is relevant to our products uh, within this area and methodologies that, that uh, we are together on these days. Um, and furthermore, I'd like to bring your attention to the vast amount of uh, unknowns and difficulties in extrapolating fundamental science into industrial applications, partly due to, uh, you can say, uh, the, the scale difference. Um, you probably know and hopefully appreciate the qualities of Lerpak butter uh, and milk fat is uh, probably the most complex natural uh, fat blend. Um, so, uh, and it, it is of course behind the rich taste that we have in, in butter. So there, there are approximately 400 different fatty acids in, in milk fat. Uh, milk fat crystals are known to, well, they are important and fundamental to the qualities of butter. Um, and uh, they are well described. Here are some figures from, from Kaufman uh, showing that uh, alpha crystals uh, are formed initially when, you, if, when you're flash cooling um, uh, milk fat. And then uh, over around an hour, they transition into beta mark crystals and hardly any beta crystals are formed. Uh, by the way, in margarine, uh, plant-based margarine, it, it's very different and, and beta crystals can form and, and cause uh, a brittleness and, and graininess of, of the, the product. But it's not like that for milk fat. And um, this kind of, of detailed knowledge, uh, of course, uh, helps us um, when developing and troubleshooting our products. So if we have brittleness and graininess and that the water, for instance, is not really uh, kept in the product as it should be, uh, then we can reason that, that this is not caused by a transition from beta mark into beta crystals. The root cause must be found elsewhere. And uh, like this figure shows, uh, well, I borrowed it from the webpage of the University of Guelph, uh, showing a schematic uh, representation of, of butter structure which contains both uh, crystals uh, and, and fat globules and fat that is the continuous phase uh, after phase conversion and also droplets of water. So it's, it's a very complex, uh, you can say higher order structure that we have here. Um, and that is where we should look for causes of uh, product defects then because it's not the, the form of the crystal that is something wrong with. Um, of course, well, there's quite a lot still to troubleshoot uh, to find out what is the defect, but it could be growth of crystals or it could be interactions between crystals, fat, water droplets. Um, so, so there are many other places to look, but at least when you can rule, rule out something, uh, you are one step further ahead of, of finding, uh, finding out what's the problem or developing a better product. Um, and then, ho however, uh, when we are doing science, we are often trying to simplify, purify, keep everything but one thing constant and as controlled as possible. So when studying milk fat crystallization, for instance, this is usually done using anhydrous milk fat. But uh, in reality, uh, we have water, salt, proteins, fermentation metabolites, and so on and so forth in our products. They are much more complex than those 
pure systems, model systems. Um, and also when we're scrutinizing a sample scientifically, it's usually a very small sample. For instance, here when loading something into uh, analytical machinery, it's in, in the microliter uh, volume range. Whereas uh, foods are higher volumes um, and, uh, and production scale is of course uh, huge. Uh, and for instance, butter at Arla, we're producing it at three sites globally. And uh, the production uh, amounts to more than 100,000 tons per year. Uh, so, 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 well, that's why I, that gave rise to my title here on, <laughs> it's a matter of scale also. Um, because the control we have at lab and the control in production scale are also on different scales. So we are, we're cooling down, we are heating, we're centrifuging, heating again, mixing, pumping, <laughs> doing phase conversion, adding ingredients, heating again, storing, packaging, transporting. And then at some point the consumer takes over and uh, well, doing a not so scientific temperature cycling in the fridge and on the uh, dining table. So, uh, so the life of the product is a, is a very long journey through a lot of different conditions. And hopefully still the consumer can enjoy uh, a, a great product. Um, but how do we get a better understanding of, of all those structural changes uh, during the processing uh, intended and not so intended conditions uh, that the product uh, is meeting on in, in, during its life. Um, and what, what might be the, the, the importance of the heterogeneity that we have in raw materials and processing conditions? Um, well, just imagine the scale, if we are pumping, could be 10 or 50 cubic meters of liquid, be that milk or cream, uh, into production or storage tanks, uh, it takes us hours to fill a tank or empty a tank. So there might be quite a difference between the first milliliter and the last milliliter entering or exiting that tank. So that's, that's a dimension that we usually do not look into at lab scale at all. But what does uh, this these differences, what do they actually mean? Uh, how important are they? How do we study them? Uh, how do we scale this down into the lab uh, and address it? I think there's a, an entire world of, of, of complexity that we are not really oftentimes trying to address. Well, you can think about this a lot and uh, please do so. Now turning to, to proteins, milk proteins, uh, and looking at the majority of the milk proteins, the caseins, they're known to form these uh, supermolecular uh, structures composed of both the four casein families, but also nanoclusters of phosphate, uh, calcium phosphate. Um, and the structure and, and function of the casein micelle as a carrier of both protein and, and calcium phosphate for bone growth is, uh, I would say, one of nature's wonders. Um, and it's also been the, 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 the topic for scientific debate on structure for, for many, many years. Uh, I I'm not sure we have reached consensus now, but at least we have reached quite good models that explain all the phenomena that we are experiences, experiencing uh, working with caseins. Um, but there's a lot that still is not described and understood in detail. Just some examples here, uh, a graph from uh, you at, at, all, uh, at Allies, um, showing how temperature affects the solubility of the caseins. So at low temperature, you have higher solubility of caseins and you have a lower solubility. And likewise, at higher temperatures, uh, uh, the caseins are not soluble, but, 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 but more born in, 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 in this um, colloidal state in the micelle. Um, so, uh, well, we know this, but the, the kinetics 
uh, is not really well described yet. Um, and it's also a bit difficult because it, some of it happens fast and maybe something happens slowly. And how do you really capture this? Um, likewise, if we're looking at, at the effect of, of heating and, and, and cooling and, and looking at uh, here it is skim milk, and again, the relative change over time when you're heating, um, well, I just need my pointer here, I think. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so when heating, you, you have this, uh, well, change in pH and in temperature, of course, and then uh, uh, also turbidity. But then when you're cooling, uh, well, temperature uh, and, uh, and pH are following uh, the same way as when you heat it, but, but the turbidity uh, is much slower. Uh, returning here at this treatment of skim milk, returning to the same turbidity as it started by. But if you are, uh, if you're heating it not to 20 degrees, but to 40 degrees, it, it seems to maybe not return, or at least not in the time scale studied here. So there's a, there's a, there's a change here. Um, so, uh, of course, it's complex because you, well, you actually really to know this, this system, you'll need to study it uh, uh, at a range of different parameters. So it's it's quite a huge experimental space that uh, that we we don't have a, a full model of how this works. Um, but still, you can utilize parts of it. Here's an example by by Schaefer, uh, uh with a process that you can use to to partly purify beta casein from the from the casein micelles. Beta casein is uh, is diffusing out of the casein micelle partly uh, at low temperatures. So by microfiltrating and diafiltrating uh, at High temperature first, you can purify more or less the casein myocells. And when you then store them at cold temperature, uh, a lot of the beta casein is leaving the micelle and going into solution. Um, so if you uh, microfiltrate and micro diafiltrate again, you can wash out the beta casein partly. And in, in this way, and by, uh, by, by full control of time and temperature, uh, you can optimize a, a production of, of beta casein and beta casein depleted casein. Um, but here you are controlling time and temperature really well to do this. Um, um, and uh, well, another thing that's happening if you look at, at calcium, also when, when uh, uh, when concentrating, and uh, this is a work by, by Koretic, uh, present here, I guess, uh, somewhere in the audience, and, and Lee, back from 2014. Uh, if you're looking at, at the, the calcium leaving the casein micelle, depending on pH, depending on, on uh, whether the sample was heated uh, or, or not uh, before the study, and then concentrating it. You get very different uh, uh, responses of, of calcium leaving the micelle and going into solution. Um, and knowing how important calcium is, uh, then you can start wondering uh, what this can be used for, and uh, and not least which effect it might have in uh, in all kinds of uh, dairy pr production processes. Again, here in the lab, you have a well-controlled system working with few milliliters, uh, exactly controlling the temperature, time, and everything as, as you do in the lab. But uh, then in, in, uh, in the industrial reality, uh, we are collecting milk and farm. Uh, it is collected over, over sometimes several days at the farm before it's collected by, by our tankers. And of course, the milk is cooled when it is uh, stored at the farm. But uh, you could say one tank, one farm tank of milk has many different ages because there are many milkings going into the same cool storage. So the time stored cold will be a mixture over time. So in one tanker leaving from a farm, you will have milk that has been stored at cold temperature for different times, now mixed. Then that enters the dairy. 
and it is uh, again stored maybe uh, it is separated it is uh, re uh, mixed standardized to different uh, uh, fat contents and pumped around and um, heated and <laughs> and stored again and so on uh, and so forth uh, going into a lot of different processes yielding the different products it's just to say we do not have the kind of control over time and temperature that you have in the lab at all. Um, so uh, so that's a, an extremely high complexity if you would really want to understand exactly what is happening. So you're just understanding the raw material uh, going into the process here. Um, Well, um, so when when we're doing production, sometimes we are using you know several silos of milk for one production, and and it, it means that there, there will be quite a heterogeneous raw material, and uh, some phenomena uh, might be based on the mixture you have of raw material in your tank. Uh, what are actually the, the the histories of each micelle? In, in such a silo, um, are there some of the blends and mixtures here that are that are beneficial or uh, detrimental to to the to the product? Um, what about if you're storing it uh, storing it cold and then filtering it? Uh, then you will lose calcium. Uh, would that be good or bad? Well, depends on the product and the process following. Uh, you can easily maybe have too high calcium in serum and you'll get fouling and, and clogging of, of uh, heat treatment systems. And um, yeah, we also know that calcium ions are of course very uh, important for, for protein-protein interactions. Uh, so it will affect uh, a lot of products. Uh, likewise, beta casing, the most mobile, you could say casing, leaving the micelle, is also caused, uh, known to cause bitter taste, um, Quite uh, easily, so so taste might be you know uh, variable due to this uh, lack of control. You could say um, so so, but there's a huge scale uh, that makes it uh, more complex than than the way we usually study in in, in the lab. So so this is just. Just to say what 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 is the reality of industry and and uh, maybe bringing some attention to to studying some of the phenomena ha uh, happening on on that scale, bringing that back uh, and looking at the structures uh, and structural changes uh, happening under these conditions on on those time scales and in and with those complexities of of size um, that we have in industry. And um, well, that was actually the talk I wanted to, to give you as an input into the workshop here. Thank you, Peter. Uh, maybe you can close down your presentation so we can yeah. see some faces. Yes. Great. So we have some, uh, thank you first for an uh, insight in some industry uh, perspective. That's always good to have. Uh, we have some questions here in the chat. Uh, first from uh, Tommy. In some products, you mix milk fat with vegetable uh, vegetable oil, like in the Swedish product uh, Brigot. This, mean, this means that lipid diversity changes. In such is such mixed products less challenging in terms of maintaining product quality. Mm. Well, I guess maybe I should jump in, Peter. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I had a feeling that you might want me to, to I, give some I was to that. thinking very much about you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that it's a smaller challenge when we start manipulating the triglyceride composition. It's a different challenge. So basically, it, it brings us to trying to understand, you could call it oil binding or interactions between liquid oil and milk fat. And it's not just a challenge during production, it's very much also a challenge uh, in consumer situations. 
uh, suddenly it becomes more of uh, an important point to study structures at slightly elevated temperatures, uh, like the temperature that the, the product would have on a at a dinner table. Mm. Um, so basically, we have fewer building blocks to make the uh, crystal network, and uh, that makes the product maybe more fragile in some aspects. Mm. So definitely understanding these interactions between different mm. kinds of triglycerides mm. is a very important one for us. Mm. Great, we have another question here. Uh, with scaling, there is automatically a higher negative impact when failing, and we all know that quality will fail over time. A modern industry will also invest in high-tech equipment, with, which increases the competence needed in all areas of the business. How do you cope with this transition? Mm. I'm not sure I really completely understand the question. I can uh, elaborate on the question if you want. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I have a background in the, in the med tech industry, and I know from um, from that period when I worked at this uh, company uh, producing incontinence products, uh, we, we saw this transition from having uh, equipment in the production uh, from when you were adjusting the, the older equipment, then you can use like wrenches and, and that kind of stuff to, to steer the material in the production line. But then the more modern machines required more um, technically skilled staff, which was quite hard to find. Uh, and uh, people who were more knowledge in, uh, in programming and so on in, to be able to run these machines. And I believe that it's like the same transition in every industry going from yeah old machines to more modern machines yes i think that um well we are moving in you know uh, having more and more automated processes uh, which of course increases the control but i think that also a lot of the machinery just the, the, the just the amount of of stainless steel that we have as our uh, production infrastructure and the investments uh, in that it, it it gives us definitely some limits we cannot just you know move forward and have the most uh, advanced equipment at any time we need to also to it's simply too too uh, expensive so uh, we need to wear down our equipment and production uh, equipment before we are investing in new and improved ones. But we're trying to, you know, uh, modernize uh, our production system. But uh, it, it happens over time gradually, and I think we, we are increasing in control. We are also more and more trying to incorporate sensors uh, in the production systems, and we are collecting a vast amount of data. So. We are also looking forward to improved methodologies in, in, in big data analysis, because you know we're collecting data, but, but getting knowledge from the data, from production data, that's, that's a, a very difficult task that we are. I don't think we are addressing that enough. I think there's a lot to learn from it if, it, if we could address it the right way. I think a lot will happen over the next few years in that field. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Do you see any role for neutron X-ray scattering in Arla's R&D process? Um, for sure, yes. Uh, but I, I cannot right away point exactly to, you know, just giving you uh, the perfect project to run. <laughs> but but for sure, just, I mean, just looking at the case in my cell and, and, and the huge complexity that it has and how it affects our products. For sure, there will be a lot to learn and a lot of control that we could have if we understood the system better. So of course, it doesn't necessarily require neutron scattering, but 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 just looking at the structure of, of the case in my cell, definitely uh, scattering techniques are, are relevant to study them. And likewise with the fat crystals. Um, 
you can say if we can develop more into being able to handle more complex samples and still get you know useful uh, data from analyzing a more complex sample uh, then it would better uh, you can say address the complexity we have in a, in a real product uh, because there's still quite a long distance as, as I pointed out here in my presentation from from you know a simplified system and into uh, the real thing um, so bridging between that will definitely make it easier to address, you can say, industrially relevant questions in a way where you embrace the, that complexity. I know it, it needs to be broken down, but we, but that's, I think, where we really need to work uh, together to try to, to mature this area. And another one here, what are complex samples to you? Um, well, it, it depends. <laughs> it, it, it depends. Uh, but one example here would be looking just at milk fat without water in it. I mean, then you could have uh, looking into cream, or you could into processed cream that could be processed into butter, and then you could even then uh, have uh, mixtures like like the blends used for for spreadable products. So you would go into you could say higher and higher complexity. And likewise, looking at milk, understanding milk, or maybe skim milk as you simplify it. But again, uh, skim milk isn't simple. You have more than 300 different proteins and, and I mean, and, and, and 400 fatty acids still in trace amounts and, and, and other compounds. So it's, uh, and, and then you can say a lot of science is done on maybe purified whey proteins. But you I mean, that's, that's far away from the complexity you have in the, you could say, the not natural raw material being milk. But then again, when you're processing it into cheese, you have a completely different thing. So, so for you could say you have simplified uh, models of different uh, foods, uh, dairy products. Um, so, but but going into really trying to get a, a really pure substance to study is oftentimes the starting point, but then we need, and oftentimes it's needed to understand, you can say, the, the building block. But uh, it's just, there's a, there's a lot of work to do to embrace more and more complexity, moving towards the foods that we are actually eating. Thank you for that. I have one final question. I'm, I'm uh, actually known as the worst summer worker in dairy industry ever. I produced hundreds of liters of strawberry yogurt without strawberry once. But uh, I'm not only a producer, also a heavy consumer. Uh, so if you just elaborate a bit, what, um, how will me, me as a consumer, how will I notice the increased focus on these technologies in the future? Um, I think for a big part, uh, you would hardly notice because uh, I think we, we are not so good as human beings to know, noticing small improvements. We just take them for granted. Um, and I think we, we, as a food industry, we are, we are quite good at, at avoiding uh, consumers experiencing product failures. Uh, and we're doing our best to avoid that. I think we will be better and better at avoiding that and better and better at securing high quality all the time, reducing food waste. Mm. So I think it, it, it will matter for, the, you could say, for the planet. And maybe, maybe the quality of the product will also increase. To some extent, of course, you, you, you can also envision uh, new innovative products coming out of this. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, I think, of course, <laughs> Being part of the research uh, and development department, I shouldn't stand here and say that it's not so important to innovate. Uh, but I mean, we are also very conservative when, when it comes to eating habits. So I think in general, maybe it's more important for us to be sure that the food is good and high quality all the time than it is to have something new, mind-blowing food to eat. I mean, a lot of dairy products are very appreciated as traditional products. So securing that we are producing a high quality all the time, I think is, is, is very important. Yeah, but it is like fun if we, can, if we can understand some structure formation that can make us make 
new new food structures i mean milk chips or whatever that that's that's only fun and and uh, great of course we should we must do that too thank you